Yeah, I'm Claire. Um, hello. I'm so honored and totally terrified to be here on this giant stage where 10 years ago I saw Weezer play. Uh, and I gotta say, Demi's rap was probably a little bit better. <laughs> uh, no, but really, I'm so, so honored to be here at XOXO. This is such a wonderful festival. You are all obviously wonderful people from what I can see from here and from what I've seen before. Um, so, I'm guessing, like, probably... That's a good look, right? Dress for the job you want. <laughs> so, I'm guessing, like, probably all of you, I grew up on the computer. Um, I grew up here in Oregon. My father worked for Intel. Um, I never felt growing up that computers were for boys or for girls any more than TVs and washing machines are for boys or for girls. And when the web came along, that was my country, our country. But something happened to me in my adulthood, and I think something probably happened to the web too. Um, I stopped feeling like it was my home. I stopped feeling like it was my country. It wasn't as fun as it used to be when I was growing up, and it wasn't as safe feeling either for me as a person and for perhaps uh, as a woman. <laughs> but I started to feel a couple of years ago like I had to investigate why I felt that way, what it was that had pushed me away from this thing I had always considered to be truly and deeply mine. Had it ever been my country? So I spent a couple of years um, researching the history of technology, looking for a lineage that might include somebody like me, looking for some badass tech mothers and grandmothers to look up to and emulate, and thank God, I found them. There is a lineage. But I also found something else, um, something I like to think of as being like the seeds to a different future, not just role models from the past, but clues uh, how to live and be better and treat each other more kindly online. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times in my life I found myself reading about some technology or some approach to technology that had it been implemented at scale early enough and positively enough, might have made a huge difference in the way that all of this stuff shaped out and developed. Might have made it so that we might have a completely different way of being and treating each other online. This is my friend Stacy Horn. Um, when this photo was taken, oh yeah, Stacy Horn fans in the audience? That's cool. When this photo was taken in the late 80s, she had just founded an online community. And back in those days, online community meant a BBS, a bulletin board system, which is just, yeah, a text window that you call on the phone and paid for by the hour. Um, she had been a really big fan of a BBS on the West Coast called The Well, uh, but it was like a really classic sort of San Francisco cyber hippie scene, and she was a New Yorker, and she felt really out of place with that scene because it wasn't really her world. So when she started her own system, she called it the East Coast Hangout, or ECHO. She hosted ECHO out of not a garage in Palo Alto, but her own one-bedroom apartment in Greenwich Village, surrounded by toy figurines and pictures of her friends and loose-leaf paperwork, I mean, kind of a total mess. This advertisement should give you a sense of what Echo's community was like in those days. You know, funny, snarky, intellectual, kind of self-hating, a real New York place. <laughs> but it had something else really interesting too, because back in those days, in the late 80s, the percentage of women online was very, very, very small. It was something like 10%, because the only people with access to the internet were people who worked for the government or who worked in computer science. And there weren't a lot of women. And if you were a woman online, it was usually a lot easier to just use like a gender neutral or male pronoun or alias so that people wouldn't bother you because there was lots of harassment. And women had a really hard time finding each other online because of that. Um, it was difficult to know who was who. I mean, still to this day, but even more so then. Except on Echo. On Echo, there were 40% female users, almost parody, which is bonkers for the time. I mean, it was the only place online where women could be expected to have a reasonable conversation with one another and find one another. And, you know, Stacey always resisted this idea that she did that or she had a female user base of that significant volume because she was trying to create like a safe space for women. I mean, this is a real Gen Xer. In 1998, she said, bite me. I wanted more women on Echo to make it better because she knew that a more diverse user base meant a more interesting conversation, a better community, a more fun community to participate in. 
And she had those female users because she was the only person actually trying to court women. She did a lot of really analog stuff. She really pounded the pavement. Um, she would go to parties and galleries and bars in New York City and just try to convince people to buy a modem, which, you know, cost $100 at that time and seemed like a really um, daunting proposition. She made access free for women for an entire year. If a woman joined her service and then left, she would call her on the phone personally and ask, what happened? Did something happen? Are you OK? Do you want to come back? She made private spaces on the service so that women could talk to each other and report harassment if necessary. She taught Unix classes out of that apartment so that a lack of technical knowledge wouldn't be a limitation for helping people get online for the first time. But beyond all of that outreach, she actually just built the system to be accommodating to all people. She baked it into the design of her system. So back in those days, online communities were moderated by hosts much like hosts at a party. These were users who were kind of deputized to moderate conversation and come up with things to talk about and make sure people were being nice to each other and generally set the tone of the dialogue in the space. Now, Echo, for every single conversation, of which there were hundreds, you know, everything from Star Trek to death to culture to art to music, every conversation had two hosts, a man and a woman. That meant that every time a woman signed on to the service, sometimes signing on to the online experience for the very first time in their lives, they saw themselves represented, not just in the power structure of the place, but in its culture, in its community. And that had a huge impact on the way that the service was experienced and received for all of these people. Echo actually still exists today, and this is very much what it looks like. <laughs> it is one of the oldest continuously operating online communities in the world. And it's this insanely interesting, vital peek into the way the internet used to be. I mean, if you sign into Echo today, you can read conversations about 9-11 and about O.J. Simpson's Bronco chase and about the Clarence Thomas hearings. You can see what people were saying and thinking about all this really important stuff at the time. And it's really outside of time because Stacy never sold, she never franchised, she never indulged in the fantasy of an IPO during those lucrative dot-com bubble years in New York. She never even made the jump to the web, because when the web came along, she didn't have enough money to make a hypertext interface for her service. So to this day, the only way to get an account on Echo is actually to send away in the mail to get one. And you get a package in the mail with a brochure with a list of Unix commands, and it takes a whole afternoon to figure out how to do it. At least, if you're me. <laughs> I'm a member. But Stacy is a remarkable person, and I'm telling you the story about how she achieved gender parity on an entirely male-dominated internet because she cared enough to make it so. And her service has stayed online, nurturing its small but admittedly incredibly passionate community of users because she has cared enough to keep it so. And that's a word that we don't hear a lot, maybe, in relation to experiences on screens, care. Um, for a lot of people in tech as an industry, caring means caring about, investing without immediate promise of remuneration in the prospect of building something new, something disruptive, something insanely great, as my fashion icon Steve Jobs would say. It means risking stability and sanity in order to make something new, and that's totally commendable and amazing. But what Stacy's legacy represents to me is this lost opportunity of thinking of care as something other than just the excitement of the pitch room or the startup, but not caring about, but caring for and caring after. Continuing that commitment of care and participation and moderation long beyond the exciting early moments and into the tedious workaday realities of a technology or a platform once it has been built. I know that Echo can never realistically compete with any of its inheritors, but I still keep coming back to that story because it represents to me this great lost opportunity. What if the architects of our present day social media environments actually made the kinds of efforts at outreach and inclusion and representation and mutual respect that someone like Stacy made early on without fanfare, just because she thought it was the way that you build things, because she thought that was the right thing to do? What if those values and that approach were integral to how we built things? Would I be standing here talking to you about how I don't feel like the internet is my country anymore? I don't think so. And Stacy isn't an outlier, because if you're looking for women in the history of technology, it really helps to look first where people are cared for, where users are valued. 
to look in those places where form gives way to function, because a computer is a machine that condenses the world into numbers to be manipulated upon and outputted, and on that much we can agree. But making that process comprehensible and useful to as many people as possible, regardless of technical skill or know-how or background, well, that's not an essentially feminine pursuit by any means. Nothing is. But the women that I talked to and hung out with and studied for years, well, they all seem to understand it as being fundamental, inalienable, and totally right. Let me give you another example. This is Wendy Hall. Dame Wendy Hall, actually. She was given the female equivalent of a knighthood for her contributions to computer science. But when this picture was taken in the 80s, she was just a lecturer at the University of Southampton in the UK. And she was totally obsessed with this crazy newfangled thing called hypertext, which in those days before the web just meant the study and practice of connecting ideas, multimedia information, text together in closed computer systems using links. It's very novel at the time. And it really was a study of just turning all of that massive amount of digital information that computer memory was beginning to make accessible in those days into useful, applicable knowledge, into systems for learning and teaching. Wendy. She'd been turned on to hypertext through this totally anachronistic, weird British computer system called the Domesday Disks. Is anybody familiar with this? God, I love this conference. Okay, wow. Um, <laughs> I gave this talk in Copenhagen the other day, and the only person who knew what the Domesday Disks was Bruce Sterling, who was in the front row. <laughs> um, yeah, so the Domesday Project was this project that was funded by the BBC and by Acorn Computer, which is a long gone British computer company. And it was a project to essentially digitize this perfect record of what it meant to live in the UK in the mid-1980s. So it contained a great deal of multimedia information, lots of maps and text and stories, and it was presented on two digital laser disks, which you could navigate by pointing and clicking. You can kind of see from this picture, there was like a gallery that you could click around. It looked a lot like a website looked. It was very human technology in the scale of things, and especially relative to its time, because the disks included things like virtual walks through the British countryside, and glimpses at glamorous, exciting British life, and maps of British cities, and first-person accounts from kids who were sharing what it meant to be a British kid in 1986. It's a fascinating record. But what knocked Wendy out about all of this wasn't the information. I mean, she knew all this stuff, but it was the way that it was presented and navigated to be able to just click through multimedia information with links intuitively and naturally, it was really revolutionary at the time, and it was way different than what everybody else in computer science seemed to be doing, which was writing compilers and programming languages. It made computers friendly for the first time. Now, Wendy's colleagues at Southampton told her there was no future for her in computer science if she kept on with all this hypertext stuff, because they thought it was fluffy and it was not real computer science. But she ignored them, and she dedicated her efforts to creating a system that would make it possible for people to navigate images from, for example, library archives. So she started with her own library at the University of Southampton, but by 1989, she had led a team creating an entire system that could be adaptable to many different databases. So it was called Microcosm, and just as the World Wide Web would do a few years later, Microcosm made it easy and intuitive to click through all kinds of different multimedia information. It made information dynamic, alive, adaptable to the user. In fact, it wasn't like the web at all. It was actually better in many ways. Now, this is probably like beyond 101 for this crowd, but on the web, <laughs> links are contextual. They're embedded in documents, which means that when the destination of a link is changed or goes down for some reason, that link is said to rot, right? We get a 404 error. And that piece of information about what connected those two things together is lost forever. And that's a huge loss for our culture because that's really important information. That's meta information. That's the why of it all. Now, Microcosm, on the other hand, kept all the links separate from all the documents, if you can imagine, in a database called a link base. And a link in Microcosm interacted with the documents in this way that was more like a, an overlay. It didn't make any structural change to the material. Effectively, this meant that a link could have many different destinations, a link could go back and forth, uh, a system of links could be dependent on the user. So if you knew more about a subject, you'd get more specific kinds of links. So it was a system that was designed to meet people where they were, to teach people, and to facilitate education and adaptability to human use. And beyond all of that, it valued that really important 
piece, which is the connection between things, the nature of those connections, and what they mean. Good. <laughs> Now, this is like a time in the late 80s that we don't often think about before the web, but there were lots of hypertext systems like this. And sure, they don't look super glamorous or anything, but they were coming out of places like Apple and IBM, Xerox, Symbolix. And nearly every major team building hypertext systems had women in senior positions. It's just this strange little like, heat map pocket of female involvement in computer science history. And it's because of a lot of things, but mostly because hypertext as a discipline was really welcoming to people from outside of traditional computer science backgrounds. I mean, anyone who was interested in the nature of making meaning through links found hypertext interesting. So at all the early hypertext conferences, there were like poets and writers and humanists, social scientists, basically the literati, you know, of the computer science world. And all of these systems are cool. I mean, they don't look amazing, but I promise you they're fascinating. And I could go on and on for hours about how amazing they were, but for now, I'll say that what they all had in common was that they shared this value about the association between documents, the why of it all. That was what was the most important thing, because from why emerges the deepest and realest kind of meaning. In fact, it was so much what hypertext was all about that when Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, pardon me, um, first presented the World Wide Web in the US at the Hypertext 1991 conference in San Antonio, everybody thought it was totally juvenile and insane. He had actually had to bring his own $10,000 NextCube on his own dollar all the way from CERN to present on the demo floor because his paper wasn't even accepted to the conference. All of these Hypertext people took one look at his system and they thought, the links only go in one direction? They can break? What good is a hypertext system if the links can break? I mean, look how unimpressed everybody in this picture is. <laughs> They're like, what is this? Amateur hour. And the funny thing is that <laughs> the demo period of this conference was held after all of the papers and talks happened. And it happened to be at the same time as the cocktail hour, which, because it was in San Antonio and because it was the summer, there was a margarita fountain outside. So true fact about computer history, um, at the time that the World Wide Web was being shown for the very first time in the United States, literally the very first time, everybody was outside getting drunk on margaritas. So much though that in this photo, which is one of the only photos of the web being demoed, that's a margarita. Like someone was like, I'll come in and check it out, I guess. You know? <laughs> Now, we all know what happened, right? Like a year after this photo was taken, all of these hypertext systems were gone. And Tim Berners-Lee gave a keynote at Hypertext 94, I think. So I don't know really what the lesson is that we can learn from this. But I'll say this. There's no way that we can know if something like Wendy Hall's microcosm could have been as important to us as the web is today. Just as there's no way for us to know what would have happened if Stacy Horn's Echo had had enough funding to build a web interface back in 1993. But that doesn't stop me from dreaming about the possibilities of all these parallel futures. The stories that I'm telling you and so many others remind me that nothing in technology happens in a vacuum, right? I mean, technology does not fall from the sky fully formed. It's made by people. And it emerges along a continuum of ideas. The web actually borrowed a lot of concepts from those early hypertext systems, concepts like the anchor link and the bookmark. But it's more like those early systems allowed the web to emerge. They were like the Petri dish that gave an opportunity for something like the web to happen and to ultimately eclipse them all. Technology history is so often about solitary genius. You know, Tim Berners-Lee and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and et cetera. And of course, those people are remarkable people but they have never been alone. They have always been surrounded by others, by ideas, by communities, because making big things requires big communities. And that's what's amazing about technology, but it's also what makes it so difficult sometimes to see where things come from, and more importantly, to imagine where they might have gone. When we don't see the multiplicity of all of this, we leave out a really huge part of the story, and we make it harder for all of those other versions of our history to work their magic on the present day, and to hopefully influence us and help us make things that are better, more inclusive, and more exciting. The last thing I want to share with you is probably mega old news to most of you, but I want to do it anyway um, as a gesture, as an incantation, perhaps. Computing has always been as much a woman's job as it has been a boys' club. During the Second World War, women hired to operate the first computing machines were the first programmers. 
And after the war, they led the development of the earliest programming languages through this process that was then called automatic programming, which is just the idea that programmers should be able to step above assembly code and start thinking at a, more, at a higher level of abstraction. This led to nothing more or less than the evolution of programming as a symbolic art. In the 60s, women were half of the workforce in computing, and they earned 40% of computer science degrees at American universities until 1984. In fact, this is an article from Cosmopolitan from 1968, where Grace Hopper talks about how women are naturals at programming because it's like planning a dinner party. <laughs> And this is like a document from an alternate dimension, but it goes to show how natural it was back then to assume that women just do this work. I mean, we haven't been as visible, perhaps, because the industry has always found really cunning ways to cut us out. Wage disparity, lack of mentorship, maybe a systemic unwillingness to make space for childcare, and a shift, perhaps, in the professional credentials and educational requirements traditionally that had been necessary to get a job. Technology historians have suggested that the professionalization of computing as a field is what led to its implicit masculinization. Because it started feminine, it had to be made masculine. And this seems to have set a precedent that has only reinforced itself through, honestly, marketing most of the time, as being somehow natural to computing. But it's not. It's an anachronism. And let me say it again, it's not natural to computing, and a lot of us here are proof. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, nothing about BBSs or hypertext or any of that in the weeds stuff, remember this, that if there is a boys club that dominates Silicon Valley today, it is an exception in time. It took a generation to create it, and it will probably take another one to fully, fully undo it, to say nothing of breaking it open even further. But I really believe that in a technological world, technological histories are important. We need our founding mothers and grandmothers. If women and girls are able to see themselves in the DNA of these profoundly, profoundly transformative technologies, then we can see ourselves more clearly in its present, but also more importantly, in its future. And when it comes to the future, I, I don't know anything. I, I think about history. But I do know one thing, and that is if we are going to survive the future, we need all the help we can get. Thank you. <laughs>